Hi there, it's Lerald, and today I'm making a video about how to tank a Taldazar. I've made an in-depth guide for Yasma, the final boss, and let me just start by saying thank you to everyone who left a nice comment on that video. My channel manager and I spent a lot of time thinking about the best approach, and we decided to just make full-fledged videos about tanking each of the dungeons. A Taldazar seemed like the natural starting point. Should we have done this sooner? Yeah, probably. First, just to briefly talk about Ataldazar, I like it. It's a pretty good dungeon. It's not the absolute easiest dungeon, I think that's Black Rook Hold, but most people know it really well from years of having run it, so they're usually pretty comfortable there, and that does make it easy. So yeah, it's good, and it's not all that hard. Now for a disclaimer before I quickly, quickly walk through my route. My goal with Mythic Plus Roots is not to make the absolute most efficient path possible, it's to maximize the group's chances of finishing the dungeon quickly. I almost always play with pugs, usually at like 3 in the morning, and I don't want to count on someone I don't know to be able to do something they may have never done before without making any mistakes and maybe while they're tired. That's just setting people up for failure. What I want is just a route that lets everyone hold their W key from start to finish, and then still two chests. If you're playing with a group that's up for it, more coordinated, maybe you're friends with them, you can double up on some of the pulls, move through the dungeon more quickly, just be sure everyone's ready, including yourself. With that being said, this route should be fine all the way from a plus two up to about a 25. Now first things first, I have an MDT route for this dungeon, it's on the screen right now. I will put a paste bin link to copy the import string into your MDT in the pinned comment. I highly recommend using MDT. It is a great add-on for checking what abilities enemies and dungeons use, comparing their damage values by key level, and of course, planning routes and making sure your percentages are correct. Now let's talk about some of the important pulls in Ataldazar. Back in BFA, people preferred to just start with Razan, like just run directly to the boss, and a lot of people still do. I like to do one trash pull first so that he's in a better position for the fight. I prefer to pull him in the back corner of the room as opposed to the front corner because it ensures that people will move in the correct direction right from the start of the fight. I've also seen people walk into the sorted packs while trying to skip straight to the boss, so I would rather just prevent all of those possible mistakes by grabbing the stealth guy on the right staircase, pulling the two sorted packs together right off the bat. Then we burn everything down and move on to Razan. A quick ping on where you're going to pull the mobs is helpful so the players will gather up there instead of like rushing off to the boss and then realizing what's happening and coming back up the stairs. After Razan, you make your way to Volcal. I do this trash basically just one pull at a time. The only little wrinkle here is that I like to jump down the stairs before doing the pack directly in front of Volcal and grab the Stealth Patrol, which I then pull downstairs to the Double Caster, Double Shield Guy pack, and I cleave all that down. I also open the gate while I'm there so that once we kill Volcal, we can all just mount up and ride directly to the next set of trash packs without having to stop. The only other major point of note here is that I like to kill the one pack that blocks the path from the entrance before doing the big pack that pats back and forth in the very middle of the dungeon, just so that in case anyone dies from that point on, they can run right back to the group instead of having to go all the way around the outside of the entire dungeon. And that's pretty much the basic route. Now let's talk about the best points to use Bloodlust or Heroism or Time Warp or uh, Fury of the Aspects or whatever. I prefer to use Bloodlust on Razan, the trash pack in the middle of the dungeon, and Yasma. Depending on how quickly you're moving through the dungeon, you could use the second Bloodlust on Volcal instead of the middle pack, but you definitely don't want to use it on Priestess Alunza. The main points of emphasis here are Razan and Yasma. You want to Bloodlust both of those, and then getting a Bloodlust somewhere in between there is good. Now let's talk about the dangerous or most important trash mobs in the dungeon. Swords are mostly throughout the middle of the dungeon, and they're not very dangerous uh, on their own, certainly not to you as the tank, but if several of them jump on one person at the same time, they can one-bang them. So I really like to throw a lot of AoE CCs at them. Basically, I like to be as aggressive as possible. Ring of Peace, Ursal's Vortex, these are both great. Uh, AoE stuns, you know, you really want to... You want to kill them as quickly as you can. Reanimated Honor Guards are the most dangerous trash mobs in the dungeon. They cast a bleed on you, and they spew toxic pools on the ground that are pretty dangerous to everyone else. 
Their bleed lasts for a long while. I think it's a full 20 seconds and it stacks multiple times. So you really want to be careful when doing double pulls or chaining packs together when you're in Volcal's side of the instance, because rolling a three stack of the bleed from one pull into the next and then getting it refreshed can be deadly. Dwarf Racial is really good here and spoiler alert for the rest of the dungeon, it's really good for the whole dungeon. If you're on a blood DK, you can't control undead one of these reanimated honor guards, and they are a really useful pet. They add a good chunk of damage, and that is definitely something I like to do. I like to control undead on the very first one I see, and then keep it until we kill Yasma. Then I drop control and kill it there, and then that's the end of the dungeon. Other than that, there aren't that many specifically dangerous mobs that you have to deal with. There are a few important interrupts that I'll highlight here in a second, but I think the only other really dangerous type of mob is the pack in the middle of the dungeon. You can deal with Talanja's charges in that pull just by backing up to one of the pillars around the four corners of the room. There's sort of a little hump there, and if you have your back against it, she won't have enough space to charge forward, so she won't actually do the charge, and then you don't have to sidestep at all. Additionally, in that pull, Monzumi's Wild Thrash deals a lot of damage, but it's all physical, so if you're on a Paladin, Blessing of Protection can be really useful for throwing onto somebody who's fairly low health, and, you know, it will make them completely immune to that Wild Thrash, and that is really, really useful. Now, there are five enemies that I like to, at the start of every pull, I like to target them and focus them so that I can lock in on their important spell cast. One of them is a boss, Valkal, that's his Noxious Stench, the others are Zanchuli Witch Doctor's Unstable Hex, Feasting Sky Screamer's Terrifying Screech, Dynomancer Kisho's Dynomite, and the Dizarai Augur's Fiery Enchant. Some of these deal a lot of damage, some of them are crowd controls. In any case, you want to interrupt all of them as quickly as you can. You don't want to let any of these spells go off. Now let's move on to bosses and we'll start with Razan, naturally. Razan only has four abilities. His first is just called Tail. It's an ability that he uses when somebody's directly behind him. He hits them with his tail. It knocks them back and does a lot of damage. So you just want to make sure that you don't spin him around. You don't want to hit anybody with his tail. Serrated Teeth is Razan's tank ability and it absolutely shreds. It's both a bleed and a physical damage taken debuff and it's by far the most dangerous ability in this dungeon for tanks. So you want to use cooldowns to mitigate it, use heals to stay alive. You can use Divine Shield or Blessing of Protection to clear it if you're a Paladin, but I prefer to use Blessing of Protection for Cheesing Pursuit. Uh, once again, Dwarf Racial is really good here. Razan's third and fourth abilities are Terrifying Visage and Pursuit, and he casts these back to back. Terrifying Visage is a fear, and all you have to do to deal with this is line of sight the boss, which is why we tank him down in the water beside the big pillars. I think Blizzard's initial intent for this boss was the players would tank him toward the middle of the room with all the bone piles, but that basically never happened even at the very start of BFA. If you tank Razan toward the middle of a pillar, then players are able to line of sight on both sides of the pillar, which helps a lot with uptime for melee DPS, because they're going to want to DPS kind of from the back, and then having to run out to the front is a bit annoying. Pursuit is exactly what it sounds like. Razan chooses a target, then he pursues them. If he catches them, he'll try to eat them. He moves very slowly, but his hitbox is absolutely enormous, so you really don't want to uh, cheat and get eaten, because the damage he deals if he catches you can be lethal. Now, normally Razan won't try to eat a tank, but sometimes he does. It is livable if you pop defensive cooldowns and use your mitigation and self-healing tools to survive. There is kind of a big stun at the start. It's not a, a technically a stun, it's more of a loss of control effect, like when you enter a vehicle, but in any case, be prepared to not have control of your character for a second or two if you get pursued and eaten. So now let's talk about how to do the fight and why I prefer starting in the back corner. First off, this is an endlessly repeatable fight that never really gets any harder as it goes on. He hits you with the bleed, it hurts a lot, then he casts Terrifying Visage and Pursue. Repeat, 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 repeat. If he walks over the bone piles, he will summon Skeletal Raptors, so what you want the group to do is just to kite back and forth between these two pillars that are in the water with each Fear and Pursuit cast. And most of the difficulty of the fight is just on you living through the bleeds that are in between those uh, fear and pursuit casts. I like to start in the back corner because players will instinctually kite Razan to the other pillar if you start in that back corner. If you start in the front corner, they might, but it's anyone's guess where they'll go. They may go to the other pillar, they may just start running around panicked. I have seen so much confusing behavior there, even from good players, but I've only ever seen one or two people ever run around panicked 
when starting in the back corner. It also gives you a second or two to coach the party as the boss is walking around the corner to you. And you can say something like kite between the pillars, or if you're on a paladin, I'll bop first pursuit. So if you cast Blessing of Protection on someone who's being pursued, they can immediately get eaten and they won't take any damage because it's all physical. Blessing of Protection lasts 10 seconds and Devour only lasts for eight, so it will completely cover things up and there is even a little bit of safe space. If they are a little slow, you can use Sacrifice on them too. By having someone get intentionally eaten, the boss doesn't move around, so no one loses uptime and he delays everything else he's gonna cast as well. So you get more uptime before having to line of sight the next fear. I like using Divine Shield to immune the fear since it will also clear the bleed at its most dangerous point. You can also immune the fear as a blood DK with both Anti-Magic Shell and Lichborn, so you're able to do three in a row as a DK. There's no other uh, magic damage in the fight, so Anti-Magic Shell is just useful for immuning the fear. Warriors could use Berserker Rage as well, but that talent's pretty tough to justify taking in the current tree, and this is the only situation where you would want to use it in the dungeon, so not that great. And that's Razan. You kite him back and forth between the pillars, bop somebody if you're a paladin, try not to die. Next is Volkal. Let's go over his ability list, it's very short. In phase one, he has two abilities, Toxic Leap and Noxious, Noxious Stench. Bit of a tongue twister. Toxic Leap is pretty simple, you just dodge it. Noxious Stench is a channeled cast that deals damage and applies a disease debuff to the entire party. That disease can stack up to three times as he keeps channeling, so it's really, really important to kick this immediately. In phase two, he stops casting Toxic Leap and starts passively spawning toxic pools under players every couple of seconds until he dies. This is a two phase fight and the first phase ends when you kill all three of his totems. At the same time, you have a seven second window from the first totem dying until the third. So bringing them all down together is really important. And I actually find it to be a lot easier on tyrannical weeks than on fortified weeks because they have so much more health. It gives you a lot larger buffer. Stopping damage in this phase is completely fine. It is much more important to stop for a bit and kill all three at once than to mistime it and have them, uh, well, have to kill them all again. I've been in groups that botch the totems twice and then still plus two the dungeon, so it's not an unforgivable sin, but it is still pretty embarrassing. You can help coach the rest of the team a little bit just by using a ping on a totem that is high health. As Volkal is leaping around the room in phase one, you should watch the Noxious Stench timer. If he's about to cast it, you should follow him on his next leap and get the interrupt immediately. That is your job as the tank in this fight. If you're slow, people may die. Now other people can help you, they should, but this is your responsibility. Other than that, you should just try to help deal damage to totems during phase one. In phase two, you just wanna move the boss slowly around the outside of the room. If you do big, slow laps, just moving a few steps every time he spawns poison, then waiting until the next poison spawns, few steps, and so on, the old pools will have despawned by the time you circle back around to them. Other than that, you just interrupt every time he casts and try to kill him before he kills you. Now, if you're on one of the classes that can dispel diseases, so Monk and Paladin, you should use that on the lowest health member of your party each time Volkal casts Noxious Stench. That will help your healer out a lot. This fight puts a lot of pressure on the healer. And once again, Dwarf Racial is very good. Next is Priestess Alunza, and like Razan, her ability order is extremely scripted, so once you get the hang of it, it's very easy to repeat. She has three main abilities that you want to deal with. Gilded Claws is a very simple damage increase. She casts it and then she deals quadruple auto attack damage for the next six seconds. It is dispellable, so Blood Elves and Demon Hunters have some utility value here. Also, like if you have a, a priest or a shaman in your group, you can just coach them to dispel that and that's very helpful. You can also just use defensive cooldowns to mitigate it. She doesn't really deal much damage outside of the Gilded Claws window, so that is basically the spot you're, where you're gonna wanna use them. Spirit of Gold is a very simple add that Alunza summons periodically. She does basically one per phase. It spawns on the altar and immediately walks toward tainted blood pools. That's pretty much all it does. You can stun slow and knock back the add and you and the rest of the group should do some combination of all three and also kill it. 
The third ability that she uses is Transfusion. When she casts it, she channels for 5 seconds, stealing life from players and healing for 2% of her health per second per player she's siphoning. If you step into a Tainted Blood Pool and get the Tainted Blood debuff, it'll instead burn 1% of her health per second per player. Transfusion is the main mechanic of the fight. It's a 25% burn on the boss each time if you do it correctly. And that scales with key level. You know, if you're doing a plus five or a plus 50, it's the same amount of damage being burned off percentage wise of her health. So for every person that screws up, that's 10% of her health pool that she isn't losing. This means that if two people miss a pool, you can basically set yourself back almost an entire siphon set. This is why she's not worth bloodlusting as well. She basically kills herself as long as you do the mechanic right. You have a lot of leeway with the blood pools too as the debuff lasts for 15 seconds and the transfusion only lasts for five. So you can step into the pool up to 10 seconds before she finishes her cast and it will still hit her for the full amount. In situations where the spirit of gold is going to get to a pool and there's nothing anybody can do about it and it's a fairly close to the transfusion cast, I will sometimes just step in it just to beat that spirit there and still get the debuff on me. You do want to try not stepping into the pools early though if you can help it as the tainted blood debuff hits relatively hard. As for positioning the boss, I try to keep her right by the altar when the spirit of gold is about to spawn, so from the start of the fight I will pull her up to the altar. You can crowd control the Spirit of Gold, so if you're in a group that's comfortable with doing that, you can just pull her away from it and keep her away the whole time and chain crowd controls on the ads. But I find that most groups will instantly break the CC unless it's like a Warlock Spanish. So I like to bring her up there. I like to use Ring of Peace, Death Grip, Stuns, Slows. Anything that will disrupt or displace an enemy is super strong against those guys. Once the Spirit's out, I just keep the boss moving with it until it dies. Then I move her closer to the tainted blood pools so that melee can grab them without losing uptime. Then everyone stacks on her for healing during the transfusion. Then you take the boss back out to the altar and start the cycle over and over again. Two, three, four cycles and she's dead. You know, if your group is really pumping, probably only two. If it's uh, maybe not going quite as well, maybe it's more like four. But either way, if you rinse and repeat, she will die. By her own hand, actually. And last on the list is Yasma. I already made an in-depth video about her, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but I will do a brief summary here. Her main abilities are Echoes of Shadra and Solrend. Echoes of Shadra spawns a handful of little spiders that activate and chase players. If they touch a player, they explode and leave a really nasty shadow damage pool on the ground. When they aren't chasing players, they kind of just move around a little bit in random directions. They alternate between chasing and that little bit of weird random movement, every five seconds and as she spawns more and more they eat up a ton of space throughout the room. So what you want to do is you want to move as a group and herd the spiders together into one big incredibly dangerous pack of spiders. That's a lot better than having a, uh, a maze of spiders scattered all over the room. Soul Rend causes Yasma to rip souls from all of the non-tank players in the group. She will not cast it on the tank even if everybody else is dead, she'll just kind of bug out and not cast it for a couple of seconds. The souls deal a percentage of all the damage they take toward their host. They also walk toward Yasma and if they touch her they explode and put a massive shadow dot on the group for 20 seconds. That'll probably cause a wipe. You can slow and knock back the souls, so skills like Ring of Peace and Typhoon are really useful, but the most important thing is just moving the boss so that the rest of the group has a safe place to deal with the souls. So the way you want to handle this boss is to do slight bits of movement around the outside of the room in a big circle. You just want to move enough to stay ahead of the spiders, but not so far that you spawn new spider sets far away from the old pack. The rest of the group needs to stay relatively close together behind the boss. It's very important that other people stay behind the boss, not cutting across the middle of the room in front of the boss, as that will cause the spiders to be drawn in front of where you're trying to drive her, and you want those spiders to clump up and follow the group. Pay attention to your boss timers throughout the fight. When Yasma is about 5 to 10 seconds away from casting her next Solrend, you want to make a big move away from the spiders, and as Solrend is coming out, you want to ping a safe space for the group to stack with their souls. You can help knock back or slow the souls if you can, and if you need to, you can try to drag the boss away if any of the souls start getting close. Like Razan, she has a really huge hitbox, so it's better to drag her away unnecessarily than to let a soul hit and wipe the group. 
Now if everyone else dies, you can potentially just solo her. She will cast Racking Pain on you, which deals a lot of damage, but if you're on a Protection Warrior, you can reflect it. Otherwise, it's just gonna hurt. She won't cast Soul Rend though. As long as you can deal with the added damage, you can just slowly whittle her down, and this can be really useful if you're close to a kill and everyone dies. I mean, I've soloed her from like 15 or 20 million health, and it worked. It was a little slow, but it was faster than uh, resetting and rezzing and going again. Finally, if you're on a Paladin, Blessing of Spell Wording is really helpful to throw onto people targeted by Racking Pain if they're at low health. You can also just throw it onto a healer during some of the later Soul Rend casts in the fight, as that'll allow them to basically just tunnel healing into the rest of the group. Soul Rend is a pretty high damage part of the fight because of that damage transference that they do, so giving the healer spell wording and letting them just focus on bombing heals makes their job a lot easier. And that's a Taldasar. I've been talking about tanking in WoW for a long time, but this was our first real foray into talking at length about how to run a specific dungeon, so we hope you liked it and found it helpful. Obviously you can make more aggressive pulls throughout the dungeon, but the point of this video was really to make something that would be helpful for people who are looking to get more comfortable at tanking without just immediately trying to go 100 miles an hour right from the start. And we really wanted it to apply to a wide range of keys, like I said at the start, from plus 2 to plus 25. I think this gets the job done. In any case, this was fun. We will definitely do the other dungeons from this season and continue with this in future seasons as well. I think the only regret we have is uh, that we didn't do this sooner. Alright, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye.